like we have a couple more to do. Maybe. Um, to meet with this man. The weather is cold and windy as you walk to Sophie's apartment. As a vampire, that doesn't matter anymore. You may have been saddled with eternal hunger, but at least you can ignore the wind chill. Just as you come, uh, come to the door of Sophie's building, she storms out, murmuring into her phone. Yes, I know. <laughs> Don't worry. I trust you to handle it. You've heard Sophie talk to her associates before. It's always the same. Generalities and vague suggestions. It makes you think she's involved in mysterious machinations. Yet, it doesn't tell you anything. Sophie is dressed to kill, but there's nothing unusual in that. She likes to make an impression. A black car with tinted windows is waiting for her in the front door. In front of the door. The chauffeur steps out to open the door for her. Sophie notices you. I'm glad you're in the neighborhood. If you could look around for me one last time, that would be wonderful. You told me you've gotten rid of that reporter. Turns out he's still here, snooping around. Sophie is very good at communicating disappointment. She doesn't have to do much to make it clear that she's unhappy to have to return to this issue. Uh, I'll take care of it. After tonight, he won't trouble you anymore. Good. Don't disappoint me. The reporter talked his way into the building during the day. Once the doorman understood what was happening, he threw him out. He showed old pictures of me to my neighbors. It's very awkward. You understand. Sophie disappears into the car and the chauffeur closes the door behind her. You watch as a sleek vehicle disappears into the Manhattan traffic. Just one anonymous car. Best sit down somewhere and devise a plan of action. You go to a nearby diner, settle into a booth, and order a coffee from the ste steely-eyed Latino waitress. As she brings your, you your cup, you describe Frank Daughtry to her on the off chance she's seen something. Just as she's about to answer, you happen to look outside. Something catches your eye. The diner is brightly lit, so you lean closer to the window to see the street through it. You got lucky. Frank is standing on the sidewalk on the other side of the street, looking at something on his phone. You slide out of the booth, throwing a few bits of small bits of bills on the table, mumbling something to the waitress you step outside. For a reporter, Frank isn't terribly observant. You keep your distance hiding behind people and cars, but he doesn't look around. It seems like he wants to find a private nook to inspect the photos he took tonight. An alley. He ducks in, and you follow. Oh, God, it's you again. Please, I'm working on a different story, I swear. Frank ret retreats deeper into the alley. Let's just have a friendly chat. In that case, you won't mind a, fr a little friendly chat. I'm, a I'm all about being friendly. Okay, I'm sorry I tried to bullshit you. Just tell me how I can help you. I thought we... How come you're here? I thought we agreed there's no story. Usually when someone says there's no story, that means there is a story. I couldn't just let it slide. Look, I don't want any trouble. I can see that you're serious. There is something to Sophie Langley. I think you know what it is. Take a long, hard look at Frank, Daughtry. He's a tenacious man, but not brave. As the last time you met, you were sure he had been dealt with. Where did he find the courage to come here again? I like you, Frank. You don't give up. What's your real angle here? Everybody plays an angle. That's one of the things you learn in my profession. You're smart. You know there will be others after me. If there's any, if there's a real story, they will come and find it. Your best shot is with a friendly reporter, someone you can trust, someone like me. <laughs> no. So what do you say? Get ahead of the story. It'll be good for you. And Miss Langley, too. You must believe it, but something about Frank feels off. Let's ask. Do you have a personal interest in Sophie Langley, Frank? What? No. Or, I mean, she's a very attractive woman, but I make it a rule to never get involved with people I write about. Yeah. 
You're known for your professional ethics, Frank. On this issue, I've never made a mistake. Frank sounds almost sad as he says it. Sometimes I just need some extra money, that's all. Where does this extra money come from? There's a guy. He's paying me, that's all, but I can't talk about that. Oh no, we're not going to kill him. Tell me what you want, Frank. I'll make this easy for you. Work for me, and I'll make your life easier. I want to know who's after Sophie Langley, and you can get me that information. Who knows? Maybe this will become a lasting and lucrative relationship. Frank is taken aback by your suggestion. Still, he clearly needs a friend. I don't know. I mean, if there are people leaning on me, they won't take kindly to it if I help someone else. I know how valuable you are, Frank. Some days, I get nothing but disrespect. I wouldn't mind to change it to all that. Tell you what, next time something comes up, I'll give you a call. Maybe I'll have something you can do for me as well. You sound like a pro. You've done this before. I am a pro. Frank hesitates for a second as if he's going to say something more. He takes one last look at you, turns and leaves Allie, disappearing into the crowd. You're left wondering whether that was a good choice. Frank is not reliable, that much is clear, but, her, but perhaps you can benefit from, this, um, from him some way. Isn't that what the kindred do? Play people and turn them into puppets? I mean, not wrong, and I didn't want to have to kill him. I don't want to have to kill people. I guess we'll go talk to Benoit about God. That sounds wonderful. You started to look at churches differently since your last encounter with Benoit. You're not sure what happened inside, but it was unavoidably real. You felt it. Benoit mentioned that being in the presence of Father Anthony's faith would eventually kill someone like you, an undead being. You believed him. It doesn't seem to be very common, though. In New York, you pass thousands of people every night, and none of them have made you feel so afraid and insignificant. If you were to encounter someone like Father Anthony in the subway or night or a nightclub, you would know. There are many churches in the five boroughs, and you're pretty sure most of them don't contain someone whose faith can touch you in this way. Yet, you become wary. They just might. Still, tonight the cathedral looks as before, a striking landmark sta acting as a symbol of faith for people who have no idea that vampires exist in their midst. For them, questions of faith and myth are theoretical and philosophical. For you, those same questions suddenly define the meaning of your new existence. You sneak into the cathedral like an old hand, as if going to church had been a regular part of your life. Inside, the cathedral is almost deserted, and you're not sure if you're You'll be meeting Benoit alone. The idea of... The dog. The idea of meeting Father Anthony's faith on your undead flesh freezes you with terror. Benoit is waiting for you in the front pews of the cathedral in the exact same spot where you saw Father Anthony. Worried, you you approach, but you don't feel the touch of, the, of faith that shook you before. And one nods as you sit next to him in the pew. Aren't you worried about meeting here? What if your friend, the priest, returns? Don't worry, he's not here tonight. You've had some time to think. I'm guessing you found the touch of Father Anthony's faith hard to ignore. For most people, God's presence is a question of faith. When I talk to Father Anthony, it feels like proof. And why is fervor and intense as he speaks? It's clear these questions have consumed his existence. Perhaps it'll consume yours too. Uh, what do the Camarilla believe? What do the kindred of the Camarilla believe? The old ones. It's true that elders are not always so good at teaching their chil children. Maybe the Camarilla would function better if we all knew these stories. Benoit looks around reflexively to make sure nobody's listening. There are only a few people in the enormous cathedral, and they don't seem to be interested in the two loners murmuring to each other in the front pew. 
It might seem like an a it might seem like ancient history, things that happened thousands of years ago, but time works differently for our kind. If the stories are true, there are Methuselahs still in existence who walked the earth when Jesus was alive. The only problem is that old vampires lie. They adjust history to suit their egos. Sounds familiar. Then let's focus on what we can verify. Shouldn't we focus on what we can verify here and now? Our blood, the effects of Father Anthony's belief. I suppose that would be the scientific approach. Still, I can't let go of the idea that the old stories will tell us something. This is how the story goes. God cursed Cain as punishment for the murder of Abel. Cain walked the night shunned by humanity and drank blood to sustain himself. Even from the point of our origin, we are damned. However, the story becomes interesting when we move forward. Cain creates more of our kind, often refers to, referred to as the second generation. They lived in this first city, later called Enoch, ruling openly over the city's human inhabitants. I see the first city as Cain's re redemption. Cursed by God to wander, he remade himself as a ruler and lawgiver, acting as an immortal shepherd to humanity. It only started to grow go wrong when the second generation begat the third and vampires started to run amok. What happened to the first city? It was a loss in the in the dolge. Noah had his ark to save him, but our kind had to rely on our gifts of blood. If you're skeptical about this piece of history, remember that even a local flood can bring massive destruction. After the first city, Cain largely departs the story. Perhaps he was disheartened by the depredations of his descendants. That's an odd word I haven't read before. The anti dilavine What is that? Antidiluvians. The progeners. Members of the dreaded third generation and the founders of the 13 vampire clans. Interesting. went on to build a second city in, in imitation of the first, but it's doubtful their rule was just. There are people moving in the cathedral, and both you and Benoit have made sure none get close enough to hear you talk. Many of the people you've seen have been elderly or disabled, so it's not surprising that you heard the squeak of a wheelchair. What alarms you more is that you overhear an older woman speaking with a Russian accent mention Father Anthony. Let's find Father Anthony and see if we, he can help us. From what I've heard, he's an exceptional man. You turn to look to see two men and a woman. All three are in their 50s, clearly well-worn by life. One of the men pushes the woman in a wheelchair. She's dark-haired and intense, seemingly only half in, in this world. Yeah, exceptional, but he doesn't like moles. The speaker is shorter... Uh, the speaker is shorter of the men, more animated and worried. He probably he was probably a strong man in his youth, perhaps even an athlete. His voice carries a Midwestern accent. We're only interested in whether he likes blank bodies. What? You and Benoit look at each other. This is bad news. Whoever these three are, they can't be good for you. We need to get out. Let's meet outside. Better not call attention to yourself. You decide to move to the side of the cathedral and pretend to pray at an altar. You walk casually towards the side away from the three approaching mortals. You feel their eyes boring into your back, but force yourself to be cool. Benoit is nowhere to be seen. You blinked and he disappeared in a burst of speed. You worried it was too conspicuous, but maybe the mortals missed it. You pretend to admire the architecture for a while before glancing back at the trio. They have settled on the exact spot you just occupied, apparently waiting for something and conversating in conversating in hushed tones. Once you're sure that their attention is otherwise, you start walking briskly down the side aisle towards the exit. That was a close call. Who were those three? Did you recognize them? I might have. I'm not sure. There was a talk of a few tenacious vampire hunters living in the city. One of them is supposed to be a woman in a wheelchair. For a second, Benoit looks at you as if he was wondering whether he should say something. 
There's one thing I've always wondered about the story of Cain. The traditions of the Camarilla put up a lot of faith in the relationship between sire and child. You're supposed to follow the example of your maker, yet Cain didn't really seem to care for the vampires he embraced. Did he think it was a mistake to build or did he think it was a mistake to create our kind? I mean, my sire left me. Is that common among the kindred? Yes, unfortunately, the kindred are selfish and cruel. You know, I'm Sophie's child, and you're her pro prodigy. It's amazing that we share an appreciation for the mythologies of our kind, considering Sophie has little interest in questions of the spirit. That's how we're connected. You stare at Benoit, and you knew there was something he wasn't telling you. But in all the talk about Cain and the First City, you forgot about it. Now the only question is, what does this mean? Does Sophie know her child is talking to you? Probably not. Don't hold it against me, but I admit finding some pleasure in seeing you suffer the effects of Father Anthony's face. faith. I suppose that's the demon in me. <laughs> that's not cool, man. Fuck you. That was not okay. Don't do that again, and I'll make do that again, and I'll make sure you regret it. You'll get over it. You know, we should meet again. We've talked so much about myth, but maybe that's cowardly when the reality of faith is right in front of us. I'll introduce you to Father Anthony. No. <laughs> You're not unsure whether that's a good idea. Benoit walks away, and you follow his example, not wanting to hang around the cathedral any longer. I don't want... I don't want to have to do that. I need to rest. So if you require request, so if you request your presence tonight, and it seems urgent, you find her already waiting for you and clearly pondering something. It takes a few minutes of awkward silence before she speaks. I require your assistance, Amanda. There is a matter of great importance, and I need to ask you to resolve for me. If I went about to say surprising, I'm sure, but I need you to hear me out. I need to contact an important Anarch figure in New York City and arrange a meeting for us. Uh, aren't... Wait, I'm pretty sure we're not supposed to meet with Anarchs. We're at war, right? The Prince does look unfavorably at those who meet with the Anarchs. That much is true. You will find that with this, as with many other things, the Camarilla policies have more than their share of hypocrisy inherent in them. It comes hand in hand with you with using medieval power structures. What we are forbidden to do, the prince may do willingly. Some of these things can be done in the open, while others are kept in secret as to not invite discord and discontent. I need to contact a man named Torque. He is an influential member of the movement and, like most of them, very suspicious of the Camarilla. That's why I'm sending you to extend my invitation. Uh, how do you know he'll talk to me? How do you know he'll even talk to me? He won't. Not yet, anyway. You need to start further down the chain and with the right story to spin. From my limited sources adjacent to the movement, I've gathered that your best chance to speak to Torg is to first meet with his right-hand woman, Maya. Or Mia. She kept, She's a regular at a club called the Leech Pit. I think it would be best if you presented yourself as an anarch, hopefully a fledgling looking for a place for a belong for belonging. Only after you talk to Tor directly should you mention my name in the meeting. I don't think that's the right approach. Lying to them won't make them trust me. When they find the truth, they won't be happy or eager to work with us. That might be true, but if you tell my out uh, right out that I sent you, she's likely to cut you off. She hates our sect, and it will be difficult to make her to listen to reason. After tonight, I suggest we do not speak of this again until you arrange this meeting. There may be a uh, many who there are many who would jump at the chance to use this against us. With Kaiser, you have proven you can get the job done, even if it requires additional legwork. I trust you to deal with this task as quickly as co and covertly as possible. Forgive me, but that's all the time I can spare tonight. What I'm asking you is part of a bigger whole. Trust me, it'll all be worth it. I mean... Okay, I'll do my best. I know you will. 
Check with Gregory for the address of the leech pit. You have my have Maya introduce you to Tork. When she does, tell him to I wish him me. Let him pick the time and place, but let it be soon. If he proves too guarded, tell him I have something that will help him gather all allies against Boss Callahan. That should pique his interest. Good luck, and obviously not a word about this to anyone. Not even any new friends you might have made in recent nights. This stays between us. The way she says that final sentence suggests a not-so-veiled threat, but her warm smile bellies the impression. You want her to keep trusting you. You wouldn't want to disappoint her. Gregory gives you the address. The club is in Brooklyn. Apparently, it's some kind of heavy metal bar with a dedicated concert space. Time to pay this Maya visit. The place is teeming with people tonight. You arrive in the middle of the concert. The music is loud and almost deafening, and it takes you a while to get used to it. This is not your scene at all. You can barely focus for the noise, but you grit your teeth and decide to bear it. The sooner you find Maya, the sooner you'll get out of this hole. A group of a dozen, a few dozen patrons are tightly packed together, and the smell of their sweat and youthful, excited blood overwhelms you momentarily. It's with some difficulty that you turn to, to, to the task at hand. You've heard your share about the Anarchs and how they fit into the kindred politics, but you only have your short encounter with Corona Park, in Corona Park, which to base your actual opinion of the faction. That might have been just a horrible first impression, but you're keeping your guard up just in case. Um, I mean, let's be direct here. You stare at, you start at the bar. Maya was supposed to be a regular. Might as well check how true that is. The bartender turn, turns you to you after she pours a line of drinks for a group of rowdy patrons. What can I get you? Oh, I like your hair. Uh, I'm looking for a girl called Maya. She frequents this club, I've heard. Yeah, she visits every now and then. What do you want with her? I just wanted to meet her. She's kind of a local legend. Yeah, ain't that the truth. Have a seat somewhere. I'll send her your way if you if I see her. You find a table to yourself after the group you saw order the drinks before clears out, and keep observing the scene of the bar. About 20 minutes pass before a woman approaches you. She's lanky, wearing a jacket a few sizes too big for her frame. It's clear she's got an attitude. She sits across from you without question. Carol tells me you wanted to talk to me. Follow me behind the bar. She leads you through the bar to a back door that leads to the side room. Indie metal band posters and pla are plastered on every wall. Some of them are 20 or more years old, judging from the tour dates. An old sticky table and some rickety chairs are the only pieces of furniture here. Sit down. Sure. You take a seat as a woman leans against one of the walls. The name's Maya. I'm guessing you visit here. your visit here isn't a happy coincidence. I don't know you, so you're either new in New York or kept an outstandingly low profile. Both sound suspect. So before you, we take these pleasantries further, answer me this. Who do you run with? I'm independent. I don't bow to anyone. Isn't that adorable? <laughs> Listen, Fletchling. You don't get to be this flesh in the game and not pick a side. Those in Second Inquisition fucks are all too happy to pick in on delusional kids like you. So are the cams. They offer you rewards aplenty for your servitude, but never actually deliver. Fortunately for you, there's another option. But before I get to that, let's get one thing out of the way. She leans in. If this is some clever ploy to oust me from, from my domain, or you're just here to spy on me and the movement, I'll make sure that you don't enjoy un undeath much longer. Got it? You can tell it's a purely rhetor rhetorical question. Right. Here's a pitch. The camera will likes to think they're the vanilla option, that what what the what with Prince Panhard pretending that they're always in charge, but New York has never been fully cammy. They might have won the city in 99, but the cams have their asses handed to them many times over the years, and the movement has been here at least as long as they have. 
hell, I moved to New York City before World War II, and that was a good while after I saw the Camarilla for what they are, a way to keep us all subservient and in line. The ivory tower will tell you they're the only safeguard for the traditions, and that kind of, and that's kind of the problem. There's only one tradition we in the movement feel should be respected. The masquerade, obviously. Dog's back. Everything else? Ask the prince, and she'll tell you. It's the logical continuation of the masquerade. But really, it's a way to keep the elders powerful and in control. But here's the thing. For all the talk of us bloodsuckers being solitary creatures, we need a community to keep up the masquerade community. Community? Yes, but authority? Not so much. We need a council of peers to keep the assholes and power-drunk fledglings in check, but not a feudal prince to tell you where the where to feed or who to hunt down when they, ste when they step on our toes. She takes a brief break from her indignant rant. So, you anarchs don't have a ruler? A ruler? No. But leaders? Sure. Most of most follow old Ke boss Callahan's lead. Uh, so should I talk to Callahan? So what you're saying is I should talk to Callahan. No, I'm saying you should talk to somebody else. If you're concerned about being well received in this in the city, you might need to go through Callahan. But if you're serious about the Anarch cause itself, he's not your guy. Callahan eats up fledglings like you and shits out self-preservation. His position is, as Baron is mighty shaky now, not least due to the fact he's backstabbed more than his fair share of allies. So he's doing what any old fire in the, his position of power would do. He's doubling down. Negotiations are out. Intimidation is in. Tightening ranks as a precaution against the Second Inquisition. She surprises you by hacking and spitting on the ground in disgust. <laughs> if you've spent some time with the cams, that should sound very familiar to you. He's no better than Panhard and her cronies are at this point. No, you need to contact Torg, and when you know it, it's your lucky night, because I'm the lick to do it through. Um How is he different? From how is he different from Callahan? Motherfucker, you're really asking for it. Her anger flares up again. I'll pretend that was just a naive question and not a half-assed jab. Torg is a leader, a local baron who's overseeing a small domain, but doing a very good job of it. Callahan knows this, so he's giving him shit. Torg is taking it like a champ. He's, sm he's smart like that. For one of us rebels, he's got the patience of a saint. Makes you think back to how things used to be way back when, if the stories are to be believed anyway. If you, you want to meet him, you... I'm going to require a show of goodwill first. What do you have in mind? That's fair. What do you have in mind? She flashes you a mischievous half smile. I appreciate your readiness, but I don't have the details just now. Ask for me at the bar when you're able. I'll leave something for you and we'll take it from there. Now, come on. I gotta go. She walks out. She walks you out of the bar and you go your separate ways. Seems like there's nothing more to do than return here later and see if Maya really can help you contact Torg. Okay, that was a lot. 